you know, the original uses for NFTs that we that people become very excited about is is art. Okay, so there's yes, this man. different NFT of you know gifts and or gifs, whatever you want to call them, uh, that people made, and you know we have we have all this like a lot of excitement from the the Generation Z. Group, uh, kind of a group about about NFT art, and that kind of gets a lot of those people into that NFT space. Now, what I find interesting that is uh, developing, uh, you know, uh, in this NFT space is use cases that go way beyond yeah. the art realm. So, yeah. I'll, I'll start with one seemingly exotic case, and then kind of go on to other cases which make a little bit more sense to me. So. Uh, one example is the use of NFTs to uh, exchange data, personal data. Okay. Yep. So, I, I recently ran across an interesting uh, an, an, an interesting article which discussed the use of NFTs to exchange genomic data. And yep. there's a uh, there's a, a leader in that space. His name is George Church, and uh, he's a he's a professor at Harvard Medical School. And he actually had his own genome sequenced, and he minted an NFT from that uh, from that sequence. And so now the NFT itself is his genomic data. And of course, you can you know he can sell it and exchange his genomic data as an NFT, which is is very is, is kind of a very interesting. Um, uh, it, it's a very interesting type of uh, type of use case that seems to uh, be developing now. There's there's other and there, there are now there are other ways to use NFTs, which are a little bit less exotic, and those to me seem to be uh, using NFTs as a way to record a a deed for a house or so, for example, right? right. So you know, the, the fact that an NFT is uh, non-fungible means that you can you can generate just a unique uh, token for anything yep. really, right? Yep. And you can exchange that token um, on the blockchain. And the, the great thing about it is you don't have to go to your local, you know, courthouse to, right. uh, to verify ownership, right? right. Of right. that physical object, it's just right there on the blockchain and, and it can't be uh, lost or, it can't be destroyed. I mean, you know, um, right. for the most part, right? right? So I was just wondering if, if you have any thoughts about these different use cases for NFTs, especially the, the kind of data exchange yep. use case and what some of the problems might be in that area. And this idea of using NFTs for more practical purposes, sure. like confirming ownership of physical objects. So uh, any thoughts about, about, you know, about those two areas if you really... Uh, really appreciate it. Well, so, I mean, I, you know, I should, I should say here, I, I do a fair amount of consulting on the second question and wrote well before NFTs came onto the scene in 2015. Um, I put out an article called Bit Property, which was very much about using cryptocurrency tokens to convey real property and real estate and personal property and personal estate. There's a lot there, um, not just about real estate, and I'll take the genomic and data transfer stuff here in a second, because I think there's something I can say about, about property transfer that then gives us an abstracted idea that helps us understand this whole space. So um, it's, clear that, it's clear that this is a killer app for things like real estate and personal property interests um, that use right now very complicated databases. So for example, um, you buy a car, there's a security interest in your car. Um, you don't, the bank doesn't want you, the bank needs to be able to come and repossess your car if you don't pay for it. Um, they file a security interest with a state secretary of state or other filing office with one of these property registries. So you don't just take the car down the street and get another loan with that car as collateral. Like you could go to each bank down the street, like get a good enough car, you just go straight down, get a loan for each one and say, here, what collateral do you have? Oh, this car. The way that they stop that is they go and they look and they say, does this car have a previously filed security interest against them? Those kinds of databases are ripe for revolutionizing. They are hard to read. They're not national. 
Um, the consequences are quite severe if somebody may, extends a loan based on collateral, but somebody else has already had a security interest in it. Um, just like the same, the same rule, by the way, obtains to deeds for physical property, right? You don't want to buy a house and not pay off the bank that has a mortgage on the house, because if that happens, you're going to have to pay off your mortgage and the person ahead of you's mortgage at the same time. Um, those mortgages don't just go away. That's why you always pay the other person's bank when you, at closing. Right? You have to pay their bank, not them. They'll take your money, go to Aruba. You want to take, you want to pay the bank off. So, so systems like that really are ripe for reform. And in the United States, the restriction is largely uh, a, a little bit political that, that these local filing offices you know, have people with jobs. They don't want a distributed ledger system to come in and put them out of a job. I've seen some really cool ideas for dealing with that. Like, why don't you turn the, why don't you turn this to be a semi-permissioned blockchain and turn the filing offices into the nodes? And then they get a filing fee and they run the nodes and they're the ones that are permitted to write to the chain, et cetera, et cetera. But why does this work so well with security interests or mortgages or even basic property rights? Well, the basic problem is this. A lot of people have different interests in one piece of property. And as that piece of property passes from one person to the next, you want to make sure you don't miss anything. And that's what blockchains are for. Right? That is their killer app is perfect provenance is moving is moving something from one person to another and having a perfect immutable record of how it got into somebody's hands. And so from there, from that perfect provenance standpoint, we just see all of these use cases exploding, including then, you know, genomic things like that. And, and this is why, like, I don't know that we need NFTs for genome research, but, but personal data is a big one because the problem with personal data is it could have been gathered from any one of a bunch of different sources the United States, the laws of the United States are wildly and, and, and overly permissive regarding what companies are permitted to extract without our, our, our permission. We're on Zoom. They're extracting information from my, from my face and from my expressions. That's not cool. There's not much I can do about that. Um, so the laws are just extraordinarily permissive in terms of what, what data managers and app creators and operating system creators for your smartphone, what they can extract from that device and use. And so it's almost impossible then to say, ah, yes, but I do have some information you haven't gotten yet. I'll make it available to you, but only if you promise to use it as I say so, and only if you pay for it specifically. And the way that we've done it up till now is we've taken that special information, we've put it in encrypted black boxes, and we've said like, you can rummage around in the encrypted black box. We'll trace you if you cheat by putting dummy data in there that if, if that dummy data starts surfacing in what you do out there, we're gonna sue you for violation of this contract. NFTs handle all of that, right? We don't need contracts because we're gonna treat this as property. If I just sell it, I sell it and I get paid up front, and then whatever happens after that point happens after that point. It's fully identifiable. We don't need to increase the supply at all. If I choose to have one piece of my data out there, if anybody else is ever caught using my data and they don't have the token, right? They're in breach. So, there's, so it solves this provenance problem. It solves a supply problem. We want, our, we want some of our most scarce data. We might not mind selling it. We just don't want it everywhere. Right, and that lets us tag it to scarcity. It lets us track it. Ah, uh, yes, I sold it to you and not you, and so therefore, when it breaches, I know it was you and not you. Right, like that. That you know, we can we can track it far better. We can track its provenance far better. And I think, frankly, anything like that, any system of human arrangement, where we need to track a resource from one person to the next to the next to the next, and determine that it determine perfect provenance where multiple entities are contributing in having, you know, like one person owns a mortgage, another person owns a security interest, and the third person owns the house, but they're paying it down. Any circumstance like that, the, the provenance tracking function, the information function of this database technology is really going to rise to the forefront. We're going to see a bunch of, a bunch of killer apps, and that's where we're going to see revolu real, real revolutions, where there's a crying need for it. I also have to say, there are so many use cases that are just liquid crap. That are that have that people have just slapped an NFT on something and they think they're going to make a couple million bucks. And what gets me, what gets my goat is, sometimes they do make a couple million bucks. They shouldn't, right? This technology is not is not 
new except where it's new. It's not new except where it does what it does best. And those are going to be where we see the really solid use cases coming to the forefront. Thank <laughs> you.